Thanks, Andrea. At KIPP, we believe. We believe knowledge is power, and our core belief is helping our children achieve freedom in this world. Freedom to be who they choose to be, freedom to invent what they choose to invent, freedom to do what they choose to do, and freedom to think what they choose to think. Therefore, it is an honor and a privilege to introduce a very free thinker. Dr. Diane Ravitch is a native Houstonian and a proud graduate of the Houston Public School System. She attended Wellesley College for her Bachelor's of Arts and went on to earn a PhD in history from Columbia University. Currently, she is Research Professor of Education at New York University and a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institute in Washington, D.C. Above all else, though, Dr. Ravitch is a historian of education. She has had the privilege of working for both President George Herbert Walker Bush and President Bill Clinton. She has toured many nations, speaking on behalf of democracy and civic education. As a result, her lectures have been translated into many languages, including Spanish, Russian, and Polish. Dr. Ravitch has also been the recipient of many prestigious honors, most recently the John Dewey Award from the United Federation of Teachers of New York City, and she was just named one of the world's 19 Brave Thinkers of the Year by Atlantic Magazine. You can clap for that. Currently, Dr. Rabbit shares a blog called Bridging Differences with Deborah Meyer, hosted by Education Week. She also blogs for Politico and the Huffington Post. She's authored 10 books on education, and she comes to us this evening to speak regarding her latest book entitled The Death and Life of the Great American School System, How Testing and Choice Are Underm Undermining Education. Friends, please welcome Dr. Diane Rabbit. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you, Andrea. It's uh, wonderful to be back in Texas. You know, I'm a native Houstonian. And yesterday, I uh, flew from San Antonio. And uh, I knew I was in Texas when I went to get on the flight. And you know, usually in an airport, they say first class passengers board first. But they didn't say that. They said, we will first board all members of the service in uniform. I knew I was back in Texas. Well, I'm very happy to be here, uh, and I thank you for inviting me. And I think it takes a certain kind of Texas guts for you to invite me here, because I am a critic of the current reform movement, and TFA and KIPP are leaders of that movement. So here I am to free think tonight. <laughs> I, I, grew, I was born in Houston. I grew up in Houston. I remember. Uh, someone asked me today, had I been to Rice University before? And I said, well, I remember biking around North and South Boulevard. So, does that qualify? <laughs> but that was a long time ago. Uh, I went to, uh, used to go swimming at the Shamrock, and that's gone. Uh, ba baseball games at Buffalo Stadium, that's gone. Sweating like mad in the summers, because there was no air conditioning then. Uh, I went to HISD public schools, and almost all of them are gone. Sutton Elementary School. Uh, Montrose Elementary School, which is now the High School of Performing Arts. Albert City Johnson Junior High, and nobody is marching to Confederate heroes anymore. Uh, and San Jacinto High School, which is now Houston Community College. I had a few great teachers. I had some really bad teachers. I had all kinds of teachers, and I'm very grateful for my public school education. If I got into trouble when I was a child, someone called my mother before I even made it back home. That's called a social network. That's not Facebook. That's a real social network. <laughs> That's where people know each other and they look out for each other. Uh, the title of my book, The Death and Life of the Great American School System, is a borrowing from a book called The Death and Life of the Great American Cities by Jane Jacobs. And she talked about a phrase that has always stuck with me. It's about eyes on the street. It's about having low-rise neighborhoods and places where the neighbors looked out for each other and they knew who you were. And that's the way I grew up. It's what, the way I live now in Brooklyn Heights in New York City. So TFA and KIPP, I'm grateful to you for bringing me home for a little while. And I promise to be as candid with you as you expect me to be. Well, I've spent these past six months since my book came out traveling the nation. 
uh, meeting with parents and teachers and administrators and civic groups who were very concerned about the future of their schools. In particular, I've met with, I would guess at this point, in the neighborhood of about 35,000 teachers. And the one thing I can say is that they're really demoralized. They are very demoralized because of the national attacks on teachers. I usually start my speeches when I speak thanking teachers, but Andrea has already done that for me, so she stole that line. I like to thank you because I know how hard is the work that you do every day, and you do it for the rest of us. But we have now this national narrative. Uh, you'll see it in Waiting for Superman. You'll see it, you, you saw it if you, uh, on the Oprah show twice, on the cover of Time Magazine and articles in Newsweek and Race to the Top. And the narrative goes like this, our public schools have failed us, and the teachers are the problem. Bad teachers cause low scores. If we didn't have so many bad teachers, there wouldn't be any low scores, and we would have 100% of our children proficient. Uh, teachers have lifetime job protections, once hired, never fired. We should abolish due process rights. We should abolish seniority. We need merit pay so the teachers will work harder. They're not working hard enough now. Scores will go up if we have merit pay. Ambitious people will be drawn to teach because they'll have the chance to make big salaries. Achievement is terrible. Waiting for Superman will tell you that 70% of our eighth grade students are below grade level. As I'll explain in a few minutes, that's false. Part of, the, part of this narrative is that poverty doesn't matter. It's just an excuse for bad teachers. Resources don't matter. Schools have more than they need. In, in the movie, uh, they have uh, a little tidbit about a jet pilot, Chuck Yeager. They said that you couldn't break the sound barrier, and he broke the sound barrier, which proves that every child should become a professional if only we had good teachers in every classroom. The movie also says that Finland leads the world because they have great teachers, and we're behind because we don't have great teachers. So what are the solutions that this narrative offers us? And you will hear it or see it in this movie, Waiting for Superman. Uh, first of all, we should be firing five to 10% of teachers every year, and that way we'll catch up with Finland. Because, <clears throat> you know, there's a long line of great teachers waiting to get in and take the place of the ones we fire every year. Now, I have to tell you, as I've traveled, I've met many teachers who are national board certified. They're our best teachers. They're demoralized. This anti-teacher rhetoric is not improving our schools, and it certainly doesn't help. And then on, in the movie, we see Jonathan Alter, who's a senior editor at Newsweek, and uh, he usually writes on politics, but he's interviewed in the movie, and he says, we know what works. Accountability works. If we just do accountability everywhere, we'll get fabulous results. That's his term, fabulous results. He should know he's a senior editor at Newsweek. He's not an educator. He has no educational expertise, but he knows. And then the third recommendation that comes out of the movie, uh, because it's the only portrayal of success, is that if you just turn over, the kids to charter schools run by this private sector, you'll get great results because the private sector knows best. And let's not talk about September of 2008 when the private sector brought the economy crashing down around our ears. So it's important to do some fact checking. The first one being does testing, do testing and accountability work, as Jonathan Alter says the knowledgeable senior editor at Newsweek. Testing and accountability have been our national education strategy since at least the passage of No Child Left Behind in 2002. It was passed in 2001. President George W. Bush signed it in 2002, January. It's been the Texas strategy for at least 15 years. If testing and accountability is what it takes, Texas ought to be number one in the nation. It's not. In fact, the passage of No Child Left Behind was based on what we then call the Texas miracle. There was no miracle in Texas. That was the research base. A law of 1,000 pages plus refers over 100 times to research based this and research based that. The law itself was not research based. It was based on this, these fraudulent claims of a miracle. 